Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Team, or is it not? Today's story with a similar plot. Enjoy watching it. Tom was working on new test data. It was boring and time-consuming, but it was the crux of all the work he and his team had done on the test car over the past month. So, whether he liked it or not, he was collating and grouping the information for analysis. His phone beeped with a text notification. He saw the screen flash but didn't pay attention to the sender's name. Several minutes passed before he saw a pause in the data and looked up from the monitor. He picked up his phone and looked at the notification. It was a number that was not registered in his contacts, and although the area code was local, he did not recognize the number. For a moment, he considered deleting it as spam, but then he thought he should just open it and see if it was from someone on the team whose phone number he hadn't saved yet. He clicked on the text, and a message appeared on the screen. At first, he was confused. Who could have sent him such an intimate explicit image? But then, he read the message, watch attentively. You still have time at Bradley's 18. He read it again, then chuckled slightly. It wasn't often that they got the wrong number for a text like this. He was about to delete the message when he looked at the picture again, and his heart stopped. He didn't notice it at first, but on her left leg, so small it was almost invisible, was the tiny mole belonging to Alice, his wife of the last six years. He looked at her again in disbelief, searching for something that could disprove what he had seen with his own eyes. But the closer he looked, the more convinced he was that he was looking at a terribly incriminating photograph of his wife. He read the note again. Bradley's was a local pub, but not the one where Alice frequented. He was in the next town over. But why was Alice at Bradley's at 6 o'clock in the evening when she was supposed to be on her way to Boston? Her teen was preparing a big proposal, the presentation scheduled for Monday afternoon. The whole team flew in today and were scheduled to meet tomorrow to finalize the proposal and on Sunday to do a full parade run-through before the actual event. Alice was one of the leaders, so of course, she was there to prepare. It was 5.15 p.m., and she was scheduled to land in Boston at 4.30. She usually called when she landed, but it was reasonable to assume that she was busy gathering the team and all their equipment and heading to the hotel. He thought about calling but decided to answer the message first. Nothing original but quite expected. Who is this? Where did you get this photo from? Should I meet you at Bradley's? He began to pack his things for the day. He decided he would go to Bradley's. He was going to get an answer one way or another. He wrote Alice a message. How did the flight go? I'm going to have something to eat. Call me when you're free. He was going to keep a low profile and try to figure out what was happening. He was walking to his car when his phone beeped again. Alice, he thought, and opened the phone. The message was a response from the mysterious caller. I'll be there, but I'm sure you'll find someone more interesting there than me. Now his head was spinning. He opened the maps on his phone and quickly walked to his car. It was a 30-minute drive to Bradley's, and it was now 5.40 p.m. He would get there shortly after 1,800 hours. He had no idea how critical time was. So he would go straight there and hope he would arrive in time for whoever the message writer thought would be of interest to him. On the way, his phone rang again. This time it was Alice. Crazy time with the team. I'll call you later before bed. Love you. He didn't think anything about it. Their conversation would take place later. He was more interested in the meeting at Bradley's and how the author of the message got such intimate information about his wife. His heart was beating a mile a minute. When he pulled into the parking lot at 6.12 p.m., the author of the message had not given him the slightest hint as to who he was looking for. So he assumed that whoever wanted to meet him here knew him and would get in touch. But it was the comment that there was someone more interesting there that caused him the most concern. The author of the message clearly knew something that he didn't, and he felt like he was being set up. But he couldn't think of any other way to figure it out. His insides were in turmoil because of the photograph. He trusted her completely, and their bed life was great or so he thought. But there was only one way for someone to get his wife's photo, and he was going to find out in about five minutes. And the thought of the finality of this answer made him afraid. He stepped inside and turned his gaze to the dim lighting. Not knowing the pub or its layout, 
he stepped away from the door for a moment and surveyed the surroundings. In front of him was a large dining room, and to the left of it was a bar. He walked to the bar, found a seat at the end, and sat down. The bartender had just finished filling the order of a well-dressed customer and approached Tom to take his order. He asked for a draft and turned to look at the dining area. His attention was drawn to a man who had just taken his order and was walking across the dining room floor towards a table full of smiling people. Then he saw what the text had been hinting at. Alice was sitting at the table, accepting a drink from a well-dressed man, smiling and dressed to impress in her little black dress and pearls. He was on autopilot. He stood up and walked over to the table where Alice was sitting. He was two steps away from her when she saw him. Her face turned from an open smile to a frightened look. He didn't slow down. As Tom approached the table, he grabbed the well-dressed man's hair with his left hand, yanked back sharply. And the well-dressed man dropped his drinks and stumbled backward, losing his balance and crying out in pain. As he pulled the man past him, he let go of his left hand and prepared to throw a right punch to the face. But realized that the man's backward movement was too fast and he was out of range, falling on his butt before Tom could engage him in the battle. He took one step towards him and recognized him. Don't get up, Pete, said Tom. I'm serious. The previously well-dressed Pete looked up from his drink-soaked suit lying in a crumpled heap at Tom's feet. He nodded but didn't move or speak. Tom looked back at Alice. The whole table was silent. He recognized several people, they were all part of Alice's team and came to his house to eat and get together. Perhaps loyalty to the team trumps infidelity, he thought, except for one person. Someone sitting in front of him at that moment knew the truth and decided to tell him. He thought about finding out who it was, but only for a moment, and then decided it wasn't worth pursuing. I'm going home. If you expect any chance of saving our marriage, you will come home now, he said to Alice. She nodded and started to rise, but he raised his hand. Better give me a minute to leave. Before he turned to leave, he looked at Betty Wilson sitting next to Bob Thornton. Betty, Bill thinks you're in Boston too. Bob, is this what Hannah thinks? They lowered their eyes, they could not meet his gaze, much less answer his question. Is the whole team really sleeping with each other, he thought. Unfortunately, he knew that at least one of them was. The journey home was automatic. He seemed surprised to find himself in his driveway without even realizing it. He entered the house, took a beer from the refrigerator, and sat down in the living room. He knew Bill Wilson and Hannah Thornton, he didn't recognize the other two couples. There were four couples in total. He debated whether to call Bob or Hannah. He realized that he didn't want to talk and didn't know much, but at the same time, Betty and Bob were lying. Assessing the situation, he decided to write to them. He quickly sent a note to both of them, just found out from Alice that the team's travel plans appear to have changed. Better call for news. Well, now they knew something happened, and they could decide whether to investigate it further or not. At least his conscience was clear. About 20 minutes passed when he heard the garage door open, and Alice drove into the garage. He was waiting in the living room. She walked in, still wearing her little black dress but without her shoes or jewelry. She seemed calm as she walked into the living room and sat down opposite him on the sofa. He was silent and waited for her to begin. He knew that silence is a powerful tool in any discussion. He decided that the silence would last as long as necessary. It didn't take long. Alice seemed ready to explode. It's not what you think, she began. He raised his hand to silence her. You have absolutely no idea what I think about what I saw this evening, Tom replied. I don't need much backstory. We are both engineers. I think you know as well as I that there is no real or objective answer to any question. Why? This is simply a rationale to mitigate poor results. So, I won't even ask why. Let's start with something simpler. How much time, how many, how often do our friends, other than the other traders at the table, know me as your cuckold among your work colleagues and our friends? No, Tom, it's not like that at all, said Alice. We are a team. Our travel plans were disrupted, and instead of returning home and hitting the road again tomorrow, Pete suggested we just stay in town and rest before the start. I didn't see the whole team there. 
Where was everyone else? Tom asked. When we received the message, some of the team decided to stay home one more night and meet us at the airport tomorrow, she admitted. But you decided to lie to me, he said. You look pretty close to Pete. Is there anything going on between the star engineer and the prodigious program manager that you'd like to tell me about? Tom asked. Well, for starters, Pete is fine, and he convinced the owners of Bradley's not to press charges, she said in a positive tone. His eyes opened wide in complete amazement at her sense of devotion. I don't care about your boyfriend. If that idiot hadn't tripped over his own feet, I would have broken his nose. By the way, the jury is still out, Tom said. Let him press charges. I've already spent a night in jail. It doesn't scare me. Agree, this will be convincing evidence, he said with a half smile. Do you love him? Alice fell silent for a moment. He could tell she was gathering her thoughts. Yes, she finally said. Silence was indeed a powerful tool, and his mind was working overtime to fill the space left by her silence in the conversation. Again, it doesn't look like things will end well. He's not my boyfriend. Absolutely nothing happens, she continued. Yes, I should have told you about the travel plans, but it seemed such a small thing. Whether I was in the city or in Boston, it didn't matter. You weren't expecting me, and I was still committed to the team. All we did was eat dinner before heading to our rooms. There was no reason for you to act the way you did. He just brought drinks. You completely embarrassed me in front of my team, she said. Now she was in full bluff mode, trying to see if she could bluff and turn up her nose. He opened his phone, called up a message, and slid the phone towards her across the coffee table. From the expression on her face, he knew that she remembered the photo and the circumstances, and he realized that it was impossible to deny it. She started again, this time without further ado. He picked up his phone from the table, launched the voice recording app, and put the phone in his shirt pocket. Tom, our team, she searched for a word. Ah, very close-knit in many ways. Most of us, then she continued, we have a small group that meets regularly. Bradley had them all. We were the ones who bore the bulk of the worries in preparing the proposal. You know how much time I spent preparing our proposal. I don't know how it started. It was some time after Pete took over as prime minister. We worked closely together, and I was attracted to him, and it just happened, Alice said. No, Alice, he reminded her. Intim doesn't just happen. First, you need to take off your clothes. There are a lot of conscious decisions. We both know that, so don't insult me, please. So, almost six months, he answered one of his questions. That's when Pete signed the contract, right? She nodded. Team, he began again. All of you, he let the thought go without giving it a name. I mean, are you all together? She nodded again. Yes, Pete said. It was good for building trust and team dynamics. Is this what he said to convince you all to start an intim team in the company? He asked. Now you're being rude. It's much more than that. I feel so connected to Pete and my team more than ever before. Alice's bravado was making itself felt again. He had a bad feeling that nothing good would come of this. Unfortunately, you will be able to see some personnel changes in your team, Tom said. What did you do? Alice gasped. Tom, if you tell anyone else, it will ruin even more lives. Let them decide for themselves. We must accept it, Alice. You should know that I cannot be an accomplice with my silence. I like Bob and Hannah. In fact, I like them a lot better than Betty and Bill, he said. Now, he added, I wrote to them that my travel plans seem to have changed. How your friends answer their spouses and how their spouses accept these answers depends only on them. I can sleep peacefully with my decision, Alice. We have the most productive team in the history of CR Incorporated, she almost shouted. And you benefited too, mister. Just because we had team planning meetings on Wednesdays doesn't mean you missed out. I never turned you off. You always had access to me whenever you needed. So, I was having fun with my team a little earlier, and you never knew. That photo you showed me, do you want to know about it now? She was mocking him. So, now just because you know and just because your poor ego is hurt, 
You want to trivialize everything that me and my team have achieved, Alice hissed. She got angrier and angrier. It turned me on, Tom felt his heart rate increase as Alice continued to defend her team's driving force, and he also grew angrier. For a moment during the ride home from Bradley's, he thought that if this was just one time with Pete, then maybe he could forgive her. This thought has long since died a bloody but quick death. He didn't need to hear anything more. He didn't want to hear anything more, but she continued, No, sir, we won't let you get away with it. You should text Bob and Hannah back and let them know you heard from me and we're stuck in Atlanta but have flights booked for the morning. This is the story that Betty and Bill are going to use, and you are going to support them, so help me, she shouted. There are tens of millions worth on this deal, and your grievances don't mean a damn thing. Send a message, and then we'll talk about what we should do next. What next, Tom? She shouted. There will be no further. Are you going now? You, your sick team, and your leader Pete can continue as you wish. We're done. I'll find a lawyer this week and sort everything out. It's a simple 50 50 split. You keep your pension, I keep mine, Tom said. Leave. You have reservations in the city. Use them. Go to Boston and get another amazing win for you and your team, Tom said. Please send these messages, Alice said in a much softer tone, pleading with me. If we lose Betty or Bill before the presentation, the company could lose millions. You and I, we could lose tens, maybe hundreds of thousands in commissions and bonuses. Just think where we could go with this money, just you and me. Forget about this misunderstanding, please, Tom. Don't let some unfounded fears about casual intimate get in the way. Pete says I'm on the fast track to CEO status. I just need to keep doing what we're doing for a few more years. Don't you want this for me? For you, she asked. Alice, just go away. He barely had time to speak when he was hit hard in the back and the wind knocked all the strength out of him. As he continued to lie on the floor with a knee in his back, don't hurt him, Alice, said too much, she added. So, the jury is still out on the fact that my nose was broken, huh? Pete said, leaning down and placing his face next to mine as I lay pinned to the floor. Alice, there must be a transmitter, thought Tom. Now I know whose team she's fighting for. Let's see whose nose gets broken, Pete grinned. Take his phone and type these texts from him. We don't have time for this, someone picked him up from the floor, only one person. He deliberately pretended to be offended, forcing the guy behind him to use a lot of strength to pull him to his feet. This gave him some necessary information. His opponent was a weak office plankton, wheezing from the effort it took to get Tom to his feet. Tom recovered his breath after being made a punching bag and returned to the game. Unlike Pete and his team of well-groomed salesmen, Tom's team worked in the field with the 160th SOR detachment out of Fort Campbell, California. Oh. His group of engineers weren't anywhere near their league, but after spending time with the crews on test missions, the team was invited to work their bellies off at the Pillsbury test under the guidance of some tough guys who flew missions in airplanes modified by his team, especially for them. If these people appeared on your doorstep, it meant that they had been sent there, and your days on Earth had come to an end. Tom and his team created the devices needed to get into hot spots and, more importantly, get out of them. Tom's team was proud that their modifications helped complete the mission and bring everyone home. The guys from Wonder 60 and their scary passengers were very appreciative of the hard work Tom's crew put into making their equipment work. And the scariest guy in the group was Staff Sergeant Troy Baker. He was well known to those who lived in his world, everyone from tramps to colonels showed him the respect he earned by accompanying his men on missions around the world. He was well known for never leaving anyone behind. This reputation was cemented forever during the mission to Columbia. Staff Sergeant Baker told the young lieutenant platoon leader to stay close. It was the lieutenant's first mission, and Staff Sergeant Baker thought he was doing well for a newbie. When FARC rebels opened fire and an ambush pushed their team, they were able to fight them off. But then he looked back and saw the lieutenant lying on the ground, bleeding from a head wound. He lost consciousness. The medic said, checking his vital signs. Baker knelt down and picked him up in the fire carrier. He's gone, the doctor said again. Perhaps, he said, but he will still come home with us. The medic looked at him as if he had just lost his mind. 
there were still more than five clicks to the landing site through a dense forest. They would be lucky to come back with their asses, but carrying a dead guy? What was this guy thinking? The senior sergeant read his thoughts. I would do the same for you, Billy, he told the medic. Stay close in case I need you. What happened became legendary. When they returned to base, the doctor met them as the helicopter landed. The medic explained to the doctor that the lieutenant bought him. The doctor nodded his head and took a flashlight with a pen from his pocket. The medic watched in surprise as the pupils of the dead lieutenant shrank under the sharp beam of the flashlight. Do you want to reconsider your diagnosis, doctor? The doc asked the medic as they hurried the revived lieutenant into the operating room. He was one of those guys who never gets old. He didn't say much, but when he spoke, everyone listened to him. He was trash in an era of cheapness, simplicity, and disposability. He was none of these. He was handcrafted and unique. And Tom and his team seemed to have a special interest in him. During the long hours of downtime between missions, the staff sergeant showed his appreciation by teaching Tom and the team basic but effective hand-to-hand -hand defense techniques. He told the engineers, it's best to know a few things just in case. I know the biggest threat you'll face is a jammed copier or a nasty paper cut. But if you stay in this business, you'll have to go to some cool places. So now, if you happen to meet one of the local colorful aborigines, you'll have something useful to fall back on, Staff Sergeant Baker explained to the group. But let's hope that a paper cut is the worst thing you'll ever have to face. Tom allowed his breathing to become more controlled and leaned back onto his captor, allowing him to think he had Tom in his arms. He remembered more and more fighting techniques that the senior sergeant showed them. You may find yourself in a position where you can do little but take the hits. It sucks, but it happens. The main thing to remember is that even when you get hit, you can still fight back. You just need to be smarter than the one who hits you, Tom remembered his lesson and leaned back against his captor passively resisting and draining the lone man's strength. Give me the phone, Tom, Pete said, looking him straight in the eyes. Look, now you know that I have a night with your wife. You're just another weakling, nerdy nerd. Do what we ask, and maybe you can stay with Alice when the team isn't using her. Don't forget about all the toys you can buy with her bonus. Hell, maybe Alice will buy you a rubber woman for those times when she's otherwise busy. Tom kept his mouth shut as Pete took great pleasure in humiliating him by making him do his bidding. Where is it, Tom? He asked, seeing the outline of a phone in his shirt pocket. Ah, here he is. He reached for it with his right hand. Tom stepped back hard with his right heel, catching his captor's shin about halfway up and dragging it down until he slammed into his Gucci moccasin toes. He flexed his arms and broke the grip of his captor, who cried out in pain and fell under his leg, which could no longer support his weight. He saw Pete's eyes widen in recognition. His right hand shot forward, and he turned his shoulder as the sergeant had shown him and slammed his clenched fist into the center of Pete's face with maximum force. He felt a bone break under his fist, a fountain of blood erupted from Pete's nose, and he collapsed to the floor as if he had been hit by an axe. He turned around to see who was holding him, it was Bill. He lay on the floor and cried, holding his leg. I think you broke my leg, he whined. Tom stepped hard on his foot, and Bill cried out in pain. That should remove all doubt, said Tom, turning around. He saw Pete on the floor, raising both hands to his face and trying to rise to his knees. He walked up to him and lowered his face next to his ear, looks like your nose was broken, old Pete. I'm just not ready to take one for the team, he said and hit him hard on the temple. Pete sank back down. His adrenaline surged, and his breathing quickened as he searched the living room for Alice. At that moment, he felt a strong blow to the middle of his back and the base of his neck. He dropped to one knee and turned to face another attack. He looked up and saw Alice with a cast iron frying pan in her hand. She missed the target and dealt Tom only a glancing blow. He rose to his feet and grabbed the frying pan. Tom, we can still make it work, she said. Think about the money. You will throw away. I'll stop all this extra in him. I'll stop them. I promise, just you and me, just like old times. Tom massaged the back of his head with his left hand and looked at her, stunned at how quickly she was changing from one Alice to another. For a minute, he thought about the alien from John Carpenter's The Thing, 
how it changed shape with each new challenge. He smiled at the thought. Alice took this smile for silent consent to her last request and moved to hug Tom. He lowered his left hand from his neck to steady her, then, after a moment's hesitation, he raised his right hand and punched her right in the nose. Not hard enough to knock her out, but hard enough to break a bone. Alice screamed and collapsed on the floor. It hurts, doesn't it? asked Tom. Your eyes are watering. You can't see, you can't breathe, there's blood everywhere. It works every time, he said. Why did you hit me? she cried. Because I could, he replied. His phone was still on and recording. Not all the records were in his favor, but he felt he had enough to justify his actions. He quickly looked around the room and remembered what the staff sergeant had told him, decide when you can act, and don't move until it's right. But once you do, do it all, and don't stop until no one moves but you. He looked around, except for Bill whining in the corner and Alice trying to stop the blood flowing from her nose, he was the only one moving. You saved another top, he thought. It doesn't look like you, lover boy, and Mr. Bill will be able to serve on Monday. Damn bad luck in missing out on all those millions and big bonuses, Tom continued. Well, I wonder what Art will say when he finds out. He considered calling 911, but he waited, knowing that once the police showed up, he would lose his chance to question Alice and walked over to where she was sitting. A dish towel was pressed to her face. Tom knelt down next to her. Pinch the bridge of your nose with your thumb and index finger like this, he said, demonstrating. The surge of adrenaline subsided and he suddenly lost all his energy and sat down heavily opposite Alice. Where did his wife go? The Alice he saw every day was not the same woman who sat opposite him. And he again wondered how she had deceived him for so long and so thoroughly. Was it worth it? he asked. Alice looked at him and shook her head. It could be, she said, if you would just agree. We were so close. After Monday, I'd be on my way to the executive suite. This will set me back. I can fix everything, but it will set me back. So this is all you dreamed of? Becoming vice president, said Tom. What about us? Deception, lies, will this continue? Tom, you are so naive, Pete knew this. He told me that your black and white ethics and Boy Scout attitudes would hold me back if I let them. He told me that I had to break away from your control and become my own woman if I wanted to succeed. Did he tell you this before or after he got your body? Asked Tom. You don't know half of it, she spat. Oh, I tried to be a good engineer girl and do all the things you said would improve my career. Do you want to know what actually works? Tom was silent. When someone decides to blow themselves up, sometimes you just have to get out of the way, she said. He was still recording. Well, I'll tell you, my loving husband, all those things you told me didn't work. I bent over backwards to make sure all my assignments were completed on time and on budget, and all I got was a few well done, girl. It wasn't until Betty took me aside that I learned what a woman really needs to do to be successful. Trust me, intim on your way to the top works, and it's a lot easier and a lot more fun. So this happened before Peter showed up? Tom asked. Oh, for a smart engineer, you can be awfully slow sometimes, Tom, she said. It was at a Christmas party a year after I joined CR that I gave myself over to art for the first time and never looked back. Wait, are you also having a night with the boss, Art Vandelay? Tom asked incredulously. Yes, Tom. Art, Pete, Bill, and everyone else on the team who can help me in my career here. Even now, if you think you've thought of everything, we told Art where we were going when we headed here. Now he is assembling the rest of the team. They will be given a legend about our absence. They will have to make the move without us. But I think the extra effort we put in with their purchasing managers will pay off. Do I really want to hear this? He thought. Oh, what the hell? Why not? Extra effort, Tom. You've always been proactive, said Alice. It was so easy that I don't even want to call it an effort. She laughed. What's the old joke? Like the worst intimate of my life was great. She continued. At the bidders' conference, it was so easy with the men that we had to get a little more creative with Brenda, the exemplary woman on the selection committee. It's funny that I can even seduce a woman, but I had to bring an old Pete as a kick. 
And if we take into account the promises that after concluding the contract we will start working together, then yes, our selection committee is in perfect order. Why then all this? I mean, if everything is blurred, why all these forceful methods? Tom asked. It was Pete's idea, stupid, she said. I told him to chill, that I would come home, calm you down, and be back in time to catch the flight. But he wanted to play the alpha male. Look what it gave us. And now, instead of being the face of the winning team, I'm sitting here with you. Like I said, this can be fixed, but it will set me back. You wouldn't buy me so cheap, he said. Maybe not, Alice replied, but I would still fly. Well, now you definitely won't fly, he said, remembering that Pete seemed so knowledgeable. He decided that Alice must have a transmitter with her. Art, are you listening? I'll call the police now. I'm sure there are several felonies involved, and we haven't even begun to go down the rabbit trail of fraud. This is a federal contract, isn't it, Alice? Tom asked rhetorically. Yes, the feds don't really follow, as you put it, extra efforts. I'm sure you have excellent lawyers and all that, but maybe there's an alternative, he left it alone. A moment later, Alice's cell phone ringtone began playing Hail to the Chief. Art, she asked on the phone. Certainly, I'll put it on speakerphone volume, Art's voice sounded through the speaker. First, let me apologize to you. Pete's actions were a blunder. I can assure you that the board of directors will deal with him decisively. Thank you, Art. My heart was relieved. Glad to see you and the board take assault and fraud so seriously, Tom. These are all very sad accusations. Lawyers will get rich, but no one wants to rock the boat. We can pay the fine. Pete and Bill will get community service. But in the end, you'll get divorced and be half as poor, Art explained in a matter-of-fact manner. Do I hear an oar in this tale, Art? Tom asked. Alice always said you were the smarter of the two of you. However, I'm more glad I hired Alice, said Art. Yes, Tom, there is definitely an oar here, Art continued. Tom, we see RAR displaced you in the affections of your wife. And when you found out about this and raised the question, you were treated in the most shameful manner, Art continued, instead of calling the cops. As you put it, we could come to an agreement. I just sent a picture to Alice's phone. Well, not me, but one of my technicians. They told me that they disappear after viewing. Look, perhaps this will restore some goodwill. Alice opened the photo and turned the phone towards Tom. He saw the inscription Bank of Grand Cayman and a number. And when will this be introduced? Tom asked. It's already there, Tom. You have an email with your account number. It was a very bad day for you, Tom. You may be having a hard time making a decision, and I'm not discounting emotions. Alice is a very desirable woman. But be that as it may, you can't take emotions to the bank, right? Art adopted a matter-of-fact tone. You can't, Tom agreed, adopting Art's manner of speech. CRAR will cover the costs of your divorce. You can never reconcile. I think we all understand that. Alice will apply. She will demand her personal belongings and pension, he thought for a moment before answering. On the one hand, I could take a principled stand, expose the whole sordid story, and let the chips fall. On the other hand, I could just leave. R had just given me five million reasons to do just that, Tom said. Does CRAR have medical personnel? Tom asked. Oh, yes, Tom. I think we have several doctors, Art replied. Okay, said Tom, you better load a few into the limousine and send them here for your team. So we agree, asked Art with Alice. Exactly, Tom answered. Are we done, Tom, asked Art. Goodbye, Art, Tom said and ended the conversation. Tom took out his phone, turned off the recording app, and put it back in his pocket. I knew you would understand it our way, Tom. We can still be friends, friends with benefits when this is all over, she conjured up, as it seemed to her, her most winning smile. But even her perky smile could not cancel the effect of the destroyed nose. Her eyes turned black, and blood caked under her nose and dripped in red drops onto her chin. Tom found the sight comical and allowed himself to smile. 
Once again, Alice misinterpreted his smile as agreement and leaned in to kiss him. Tom extended his right hand to stop her. I hit you too hard or not hard enough. In what world would I want to kiss you, Alice? She looked up at him with an offended look. Take whatever you want, but don't be here tomorrow, Tom said and went to the door. He stopped next to Bill. Do your legs still hurt? He asked. Yes, damn it, you idiot, it still hurts, Bill whined. Maybe this will distract you, Tom said and kicked Bill in the balls. Bill arched and groaned. He got into his car, not knowing where he would go, but food and shelter were high on the hierarchy of needs for a good reason. He grabbed a hamburger in one of the cafes and checked into the red roof in outside the city, not far from the highway, and fell asleep as soon as his head hit the pillow. Despite the aches and pains of a hundred, yes, at least a hundred, he believed various insults inflicted on his body. He woke up early in the morning and dragged his aching body out of bed. He was making coffee in his motel room when his phone beeped, and he reached for it. It was a message from that number. He immediately opened it. Sorry for yesterday. I can meet you in the shopping center around noon. I invite you to take a seat at the bar. I will be there, he wrote a reply message and poured lukewarm brown water from the coffee maker carafe into a paper cup. Yes, I'll be there, he thought and set up his laptop. It was time to start online banking. In college, long before meeting Alice, Tom had an economics professor who recommended having at least one offshore account as a rainy day fund. He had nothing to lose, and with the help of the professor, he soon became the owner of a brand new bank account in the Cayman. It was his Love You Foundation. He opened an account 10 years ago and added to it whenever possible. He was proud that he had about $50,000 in his account. Well, his Love You Foundation was about to get a serious boost. Tom opened each bank's secure website with a password and a few keystrokes. He transferred most of Carr's payment into his personal account. On the original account, he left $100,000. He showered, changed clothes, and prepared to go to meet the mysterious author of the message. Tom came in just afternoon, walking inside he saw a man who waved to him. He looked about Tom's age, was handsome, and well-dressed. Tom approached him. I think you sent me a message, Tom said, sitting down. I'm sorry that everything turned out this way. I don't know if there was any clean way to tell you, the stranger began. Why don't you start with who you are and how you are related to Alice? Tom replied. I was on the team. I left the army after eight years of service. I was wounded in battle, had a long recovery, and was demobilized for medical reasons. I joined CRAR about six months ago. I was assigned to Pete's team about three months ago. I was telling a friend about work and mentioned that I work for Alice. When he asked her full name, we found out that we had a mutual friend, and he asked me to look after Alice as a favor. At first, everything was great. I was warmly received by the team. It wasn't immediately clear why, he began. Alice came to me about two months later. She's very attractive and persuasive. But when I asked her about the ring, she just smiled and said it's okay with you. I didn't agree and said so. This marked the beginning of the deep freeze. After I turned her down, I got all the worst assignments and nothing but heartbreak from Pete. I called our mutual friend back and told him that Alice had approached me. He thought there was more to it than Alice was saying and that you should know. Pete sent me a photo of him trying to get me on the team so I could get a prize if I accepted. Let's just say I don't agree with their methods. I think I'm a straight shooter. I quit yesterday and sent you a message, our friend asked Tom. Troy Baker. If I hadn't met Troy, he replied, then paused for a moment before continuing. Let's just say he helped me get out of some trouble when I was a green lieutenant. I owe him a couple of favors. We both should, Tom agreed. What are you going to do? asked the stranger. Art sort of outlined it all for me. I could get the cops involved, and yes, Bill and Pete and even Alice would get in trouble with the law. But with his lawyers, it would all end in nothing. We made a deal. You might think I'm selling out, and maybe to some extent, you're right. But they stole the only irreplaceable thing I had. If I can't legally make them pay, at least I can make them pay. 
It won't bring Alice back, but I think I may find that she's less irreplaceable than I thought. I have a trip planned. Tell Troy thank you for everything. I won't go back to work, Tom finally answered. Well, Troy always spoke highly of Baxter Incorporated, and now that you're gone, they might need another engineer. I think you'll find that they do things a little differently at Baxter. You might like it better. The work is challenging, but the added benefits don't compare to what Tony's team was offering, the stranger suggested. Tom smiled. I think I can live with this. The stranger stood up. Tom did the same. They simply nodded to each other and left without another word. On Monday, Tom had just checked in for a flight to Costa Rica. Tamarindo would be a good place to unwind a bit, he thought. He headed towards security and saw a mailbox ahead. He reached into his pocket and pulled out an envelope addressed to the U.S. Department of Justice, Washington, D.C. Inside was a flash drive with a recording. Perhaps they will be interested, who knows, he thought. Maybe arts lawyers aren't as good as he thinks. He dropped the envelope into the box and walked to the security line. Nine months later, Tom sat at his usual table in a cafe. Anna, lovely as always, brought him his cerveza. Thank you, dear, he said and raised the bottle to his lips. He received mail. He was still holding the envelope in his hands. There was no return address. He wondered who found him. He wasn't going to take any difficult steps to stay undetected. But finding him in a small town on the Pacific coast of northern Costa Rica might require some resources that weren't available to the average guy. His first thought was that arts people had found him. He left it at his home for two days. He was sure it wasn't a bomb, but he couldn't be too careful. Carlos, Tom turned to the owner of the cafe. Do you have knives? See, si, Mr. Tom, Carlos replied. Tom handed over the envelope and took a few steps back. You can never be too careful, he thought as Carlos opened the envelope. He handed it to Tom, who thanked him. He took another sip from his bottle of beer and turned the envelope over. Several sheets of paper fell on the table. He picked up the note. Thought you might be interested, that was all that was written in the note. And instead of a signature, a telephone number was indicated. The same number Troy would have the resources to find him, he thought. I can live with this. He turned over another sheet of paper. It was a copy of an article from a newspaper with a photograph. The photo showed Pete, Bill, Alice, and Betty being let out of the CRAR building in handcuffs. The title of the article read, For Accused of Multi-Million Dollar Procurement Fraud. He smiled. Maybe arts lawyers aren't what he thought, he told himself, a habit he had acquired since his Spanish was weak and his English was not widely spoken. He liked to hear English spoken, even if it was just talking to himself. Anna, another beer, please, he held out his empty bottle. See, Mr. Tom. Thank you, Anna, he said, accepting the beer, taking a sip, and looking out at the deep blue Pacific Ocean. What do you think of our story today? I think the man totally did the right thing without thinking about the consequences, which is what I liked. What do you think? Write in the comments. See you in the next video.